What are the worst decisions WWE has ever made? Now, I'm not talking about business decisions, the XFL, WWE World Restaurant, or Diesel as WWE Champion rank quite highly there, nor do I mean patterns of decisions like Cena wins lol, Roman wins lol, or putting part-timers over their up-and-comers. Those are all cumulatively very bad, but each individual choice is relatively harmless. I mean, which single decisions made by the WWE have had the most significant impact on their creative product for the worse. I can think of three that stand head and shoulders above them all. NXT 2.0, taking Monday Night Raw to three hours, and the 2001 heel turn of Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, you knew that would be the last one in that three, because that's the title of this video. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts Fun. No, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Have you heard of him? He's the snake boy. Not that snake boy. The other snake boy, there we go. That's the snake boy, the rattlesnake boy. Steve Austin debuted in WWE in 1996 after a cup of coffee in ECW where he ended up after being fired by Eric Bischoff via fax machine because he didn't think Steve Austin had much more of an upside in the wrestling business. It's never fun to watch your dad make a mistake. It's never fun to watch your dad cry. It's never fun to watch your dad be loaded into a garbage truck where he'll presumably be crushed and killed. Poor dad. Anyway, WWE debuted Austin as the ringmaster because they're dumb too, but before long he changed his name to Stone Cold Steve Austin, a trash talking heel so called because of his lack of empathy. He won King of the Ring, created Austin 316, had a hugely underrated match with Bret Hart at Survivor Series 96, won the Royal Rumble 97, a year after debuting, had a hugely rated match with Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13, turned face in the process, then began WWE's process of slowly heating up Austin for his inevitable coronation at the next year's WrestleMania, a journey that almost ended in tragedy when at SummerSlam 97 and a botched pile driver from Owen Hart, Austin compressed his neck, a single move which unwittingly started a ticking clock clock on the rest of the Rattlesnake's career. Now, despite wrestling on borrowed time, Austin had one of the best, actually really short runs when you think about it in wrestling history. After being crowned WWE Champion, his feud with Vince took the company ahead in the ratings over WCW. 1996 was an amazing year for the company. Not only did they have a white hot feud presiding over the main event, but their mid card was generating Triple H and The Rock, two men who would also lead the company deeper into its most beloved era. Now, The Rock ascended first, capturing the title by the end of the year. At Survivor Series 1999, a year later, Austin's neck issues caught up with with him and he left to have Sergi returning full time 10 months later. Now a lot happened in those 10 months in the big dubby dub dub da do da. The Rock, Triple H and to a lesser extent the Big Show had all been crowned WWE Champion with Rock and Trips firmly cemented as co-faces of the company. When he returned Austin wasn't the only player in town and honestly that's why the Attitude Era was good. A diversity of huge draws, rather than just one star that has to be protected at all costs. Cough John Cena, cough Roman Reigns, cough Hulk Hogan. Austin was still crazy popular, do not get me wrong, but wasn't carrying the company on his back anymore. That fact, coupled with a general feeling that he'd accomplished all he could as a face, led Steve Austin to want to turn heel, which he did, at WrestleMania X7, shaking hands with the devil himself, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, the man he'd spent the entirety of 1998 and most of 99 feuding with. He joined forces with Triple H, the man who'd organized him being hit with a car. They formed the two-man power trip, won all the gold, Triple H went out with an injury, and Austin pivoted into an unstable, whiny heel desperate for respect. Then Steve Austin checks notes fell in love with Vince McMahon, subjugating himself for Vince's amusement, making himself look foolish. This is Steve Austin. Remember the guy's intense cool factor took the company to unparalleled heights in 98. Look, there he is in a cowboy hat. Then the alliance happened. Austin briefly returned to the old Stone Cold in one of the biggest pops in Raw history. WWE saw that pop and thought, can't have that, better turn him heel again. Got to think of the business after all. Austin turned heel again at the Invasion pay-per-view, joined the alliance, changed his music to a generic piece of trash. He led the Alliance into that winner-take-all match at Survivor Series, and afterwards he just kind of turned face because he didn't want to kiss Vince McMahon's bare asshole. That is enough to turn a man face, I suppose. So why didn't the heel turn work? WWE took one of the most lucrative and again coolest characters and slowly stripped him of everything 
that made him great. Attitude, music, merch, crowd connection, and crucially, crucially, did it at a time where there wasn't anyone perfectly positioned to take his place. When they struck gold and turned the super hot, super babyface rock, heel at Survivor Series 98. They had Super Babyface Stone Cold ready to fight him. The night after Mania X7, The Rock was written off TV and had to go and become, a, I believe it was a Beatle Duke. I forget exactly what the movie's about. Triple H was the next biggest star, but they stapled him to Austin to make people actually boo him as if Vince McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, beating up Jim Ross, the Hardys, Lita with a chair. Undertaker was the person they eventually picked to be the main face to go up against Austin, but he was just coming off the worst in-ring year of his career in 2000. Like, the fans really didn't like Undertaker in 2000. Like, they actually vote, I think, in the Wrestle Observer Newsletter Awards, he was voted the fans' least favourite personality. Kane was never really treated like a main event player. Kurt Angle had been champion, but he was just entering into his program with Chris Benoit. I mean, the fact that at Backlash, the pay-per-view after WrestleMania X7, all the gold had to be on the line, that kind of illustrates the problem here. The hole left by The Rock of importance that people were struggling to fill. Also, the fact that the people didn't want to boo Austin. When people are tired of a character being in a role, they will tell you with their voices and with their wallets, and neither of those things were the case. So WWE essentially just created a huge problem for themselves, fixing a problem that didn't exist beyond Austin creatively wanting to push himself. And he did some really good stuff, don't get me wrong. Kumbaya, for the fact that this isn't Stone Cold Steve Austin, is really funny. He had some great matches with Angle, the two-man power trip versus Jericho and Benoit is one of Raw's best matches ever but none of these things justify the fact that WWE at a time when they only had one tentpole, super draw, super babyface, turned him heel without a good enough plan to follow it up and torpedo their pay-per-views and weekly shows in the process. It is something that should never, ever, 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 ever have happened. It's one of their worst decisions of all time. There's absolutely no chance it would ever be a good idea and under no circumstances should someone actually attempt it. Let me have a go. And sure, Austin turning heel was a terrible idea, but don't worry, WWE make terrible creative decisions all the time. You can find out about each and every one of them first by subscribing to our other wrestling channel, Wrestle Talk, for daily wrestling news videos. Get on over, give them a subscribe, and turn those notifications on for up to the minute breaking wrestling news. What the f people want from me? And sure, I choose the topic for this video each month, but what do you want from me? Austin should have just stunned Vince McMahon on Raw the next night, turn back face, tricking Vince McMahon, and maybe be a tweener going up against The Rock. Austin as a heel after Mania X7 is a bad idea because of the specific circumstances surrounding it. Now, if I could wave a magic wand and just keep The Rock around between Mania and SummerSlam, then sure. It's a fine idea. Delay the Count of Crabs movie. Run Super Babyface Rock vs. Super Heel Austin at Backlash. Keep that momentum going. Then at Judgment Day, throw Face Triple H into the mix, having given him enough time to turn. All sorts of stuff you can do. We're taking some of the biggest feuds of the last few years and inverting the heel face alignment. But I can't do that. I, I, I simply can't do it. I'm a senator, Anakin. No, while a lot of these videos are fueled by wish fulfillment, you know, they should hire this guy or this person not being in this match means he might not have gotten injured. I also feel like I have to sort of stick to some sort of realistic brief. Austin has to turn heel. I have to let The Rock go and be the ugly bug Brahma bull. And this all has to go down a WrestleMania X7 because these are the fundaments of the Austin heel turn and why it didn't work. So we start at WrestleMania X7 and earlier in the night Shane beats Vince clean as a whistle, easy as you like. But after the match, Vinnie Mac is carted out by medical officials and taken to a local medical facility. He's gone from the WrestleMania card and we do not see him again for the rest of the night. Backstage before the main event, we see Austin on the phone, Michael Cole with his absolutely horrendous frosted tips. How could you dye your hair so blonde, Michael? You look stupid. And look, you've got a dark beard as well with dyed blonde hair, you f 
being a dear. Cole comes up to him, asks him, you know, what's this all about? And Austin says, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that after coming back to the WWF, this is the time where he will finally, finally be crowned world champion. Nothing else matters to him, not his health, not his life, not his pride. The only thing he cares about is becoming world champion, and that's the bottom line, because I said so. The main event of the night, Rock versus Austin, and the match plays out pretty much as it did in real life. Austin starting hot, trying to hit Rock with the championship, cutting the Rock open. There's a rabid look in Austin's eyes, and JR and Heyman play up the fact that he hasn't been champion for a year and a half. He needs this to prove that he hasn't lost everything that made him stone cold Steve Austin. What is the limit Austin will push himself to to get what he wants? Austin hits the stunner. Good God, what a stunner. But Rock kicks out and Austin is beside himself. He gestures to the back and that's when he comes out. Not Vince McMahon, but rather Eric Bischoff. The man who fired Austin from WCW. The man who just seen World Championship Wrestling go out of business. The man whose WCW wrestlers have been sitting in the stands all night. Bischoff comes down and much like Vince did, helps Austin beat Rock for the two shake hands in the center of the ring. Mere weeks after Vince crushed his competition, Vince is now hospitalized and his bitter rival Eric Bischoff is in his ring shaking hands with his top champion. What the hell does this mean for the company? Next night on Monday Night Raw, Austin explains himself. He doesn't know these people a damn thing. And more than that, he doesn't know the WWF a damn thing. At Survivor Series 1999, Austin was run down on Vince's watch and the company just kept on going. During Austin's time away, he saw the WWF move on and he realized that after almost giving his life for the company, seeing his neck broken in that company's ring, the company doesn't actually give a rat's ass about me. So he doesn't give a rat's ass about the company. So he's bringing in the only person who hates the WWF and Vince McMahon more than he does, Eric Bischoff. Bischoff enters and if 2001 proved nothing else is that WWF fans are tribal. Tribal enough to turn Vince into a baby face despite everything at Mania X7. Enough to completely erase all of Austin's heel work in one night and turn him into the old stone cold again. I think the only real way to turn Austin heel that doesn't A, align him with the man he's feuded with for years and B, align him with the man who literally planned his murder and in fact honors both of those feuds is to have him be anti-WWF. Bischoff boasts that the only reason the WWF is still in business because he fired Steve Austin in the first place. It's almost like he felt pity for the poor WWF fans after WCW kicked their ass for 83 straight weeks. And so he sent them Steve Austin, for which Austin thanks him from the bottom of his heart. Austin holds up the WWF title. This is the symbol of this company and this company's a piece of trash. For the first time since coming back, Austin is world champion, but this is not the world championship I want. He drops it in a trash can. And as he does so, Shane McMahon comes down to the ring carrying a briefcase. Turns out that Shane had a silent partner in purchasing WCW and that someone was Eric Bischoff creating a, I hesitate to use this word, but an alliance of Austin Bischoff and Shane McMahon. Three people unified in one thing. They f***ing hate Vince McMahon. They're completely justified in hating Vince McMahon, but now they're being total dicks about it. The best kind of villainy. Shane McMahon opens up the briefcase, he's brought to the ring and inside is the big gold belt. WCW's World Championship. Austin holds it up. This is the symbol of excellence in this business. This is the belt held by the true wrestling greats, Harley Race, Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair. To sum up, in early 2001, you have WCW going out of business, WWF acquiring WCW, Shane hospitalizing his dad, and suddenly the stage has been cleared for Austin Bischoff and Shane to rule over Vince's company with an iron fist. And that's when you bring out The Rock, and build their rematch in the main event of Monday Night Raw. In that rematch, sure, keep it a cage, why not? That's when you cement Austin's turn by having him cripple the people's champion. However, at the end of that match, Triple H does come down to the ring, sledgehammer in hand, and he clears house because Triple H is the cerebral ass asshole, but he also cares about the WWF more than anyone else. He's Vince's son-in-law, and by God, he really likes the WWF Big Eagle Championship. He held it 
often enough. Bischoff and Austin manage to get out of the ring, but Shane gets hit with the pedigree, and that is the feud heading into Backlash. Heel Austin versus Face Triple H, playing off their huge feud of the year. They've got amazing chemistry together. And but now this time, Triple H is trying to fight to bring the WWF Championship back to the WWF. Now Backlash, the numbers game catches up to Triple H and many Bischoff shenanigans or Bischoffigans, which sounds like a great name for a biscuit. After those, Austin retains the championship. Now after Backlash, Austin dedicates himself to destroying all of the WWF's most beloved faces. So yes, he can attack the Hardy Boys from behind, lay them out, beat people down, go feral, attack people like Undertaker and Kane with a lead pipe. He tells the locker room that no one is safe. Typical Steve Austin DTA shit. But now, on the side of evil. We build towards Judgment Day and one final match between Triple H and Steve Austin. This time, hell in a cell. Eric Bischoff wants to cripple Vince's company to make WWF feel like its time is running out. Bischoff agrees to the cell stipulation for Judgment Day on one condition that Triple H's career is on the line. A couple of reasons for this. It's to give Triple H that time off because booking alternatives to real life serious injuries makes me feel a bit weird. But also, this is a lot of Triple H Steve Austin matches. Three major pay-per-view matches between the two in the space of half a year. Now, I mean, the reason this is happening is that Trips is the biggest non-rock star in the company at the time. But at least this way, all the matches should feel different. Three stages of hell, a world championship match with alignment switched, then Hell in a Cell with a career on the line. At Judgment Day, Austin nails Triple H with a title, hits him with not one, not two, but three Stone Cold Stunners and pins the game, banishing him from the WWF. Austin is systematically removing things we love from the company. The big belt, one of the biggest stars of the Attitude Era, and all while remaining some semblance of a badass. There is no need for a cowboy hat here. After Triple H, that's when we pivot to Steve Austin versus Kurt Angle. Now, as we saw in real life, it shouldn't be too hard to turn Kurt face. He's very much Mr. WWF, having never worked for Bischoff. Also, King of the Ring is the next pay-per-view, and no one's had more success at that show in recent years than Kurt Angle. In fact, we don't even have to lose the precious Angle versus Shane McMahon street fight. After Angle's feud with Chris Benoit at Judgment Day, the two can shake hands. Finally, having earned each other's respect, Angle will turn face that way, and Angle becomes the number one contender. And that's when Austin, Shane, and Bischoff attack. Bischoff announces that since King of the Ring is Kurt's special event, and since he's used to working multiple times in a night, sure, he'll get Steve Austin one-on-one -on -one for the World Championship, but first, he has to go through Shane in a street fight earlier on the card. Angle beats Shane, but his injuries catch up to him in the main, and Austin pins him clean to retain the WCW World Championship. Now, the next pay-per-view is the last one before SummerSlam, what was the Invasion pay-per-view, but now, in fact, it's fully loaded. Austin brags about how he's unstoppable and how he will systematically beat every single piece of trash in the company until there is no more WWF. Just him, Steve Austin, the only professional wrestler in the world who's worth even half a damn. And that's when you run Austin versus all of the WWF main event scene in the main event are fully loaded. Austin versus Angle versus Undertaker versus Kane. Eric Bischoff is really starting to get above his station. And Austin is legit pissed being put into a match with four people who want to skin him and wear him as a gaudy Texas-shaped belt buckle. There's dissension in the ranks of the Alliance. During the main event, a fully loaded, Bischoff accidentally clocks Steve Austin with the belt, which almost costs him the title, but for the fact that it's a fatal four-way, so someone else breaks up the pin. And in the chaos, Austin manages to hit Kane with a stunner and pin him to retain the championship. As Austin celebrates in the ring after the match, if you smell, la, 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 the Rock returns to set up Rock versus Austin, the rematch at SummerSlam. And as well, that's a story that is gonna bring a close circle to Austin as a heel. The Rock and Steve Austin cut promos on each other in the build-up to SummerSlam. The Rock reminds Stone Cold that it's always been the two of them, Rock and Austin, Austin and Rock. The two central pillars of the WWF in the Attitude Era, reminding Austin of the man he used to be. He shows some footage of himself as the ringmaster, tells Austin, yes, you helped build this place, but this place also built you. Vince McMahon may be a no good monkey ass jabroni or whatever it is the Rock says, get your Rock catchphrase bingo cards, but he never sent Austin's ass packing via a fax or stole a promotion 
from his daddy. Rock tries to cause further dissension between Austin, Bischoff, and Shane, and it starts to work with Austin hitting Shane McMahon with a stunner, but refusing to hit one on Bischoff. Not yet. The main event of SummerSlam, Austin versus Rock. And while the first one was Austin's journey to becoming a heel, this time it's his journey back to becoming a face, realizing that Bischoff is the greater evil and coming to terms with his place in the WWF at this stage of his life. In the end, The Rock hits Austin with the rock bottom and pins him to become the new WWF champion. The WCW belt is discarded. The Rock brings back the big eagle. He's celebrating with it when he comes face to face with Austin, who extends a hand, which The Rock shakes. Bischoff runs into the ring to get in Austin's face. What the hell are you doing? Austin drops him with the stunner, turning face once more. The next night on Raw, Eric Bischoff vows, this isn't over. And that's when, hearkening back to a certain video I made about the invasion all those years ago, that's when Bischoff brings in the NWO. You can just buy out the contracts and you can bring them in and make, you can make the money back with a few crazy high pay per view. Like, it, it's not hard. Bischoff and the NWO invade the WWF, and that's when Vince makes a huge return as a babyface, announcing also that he's rehired Triple H. The next pay per view is Invasion. The main event, Austin, Rock, Triple H versus Hollywood Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash. Boom. Use the Austin heel turn to set the stage for a delayed invasion storyline that'll culminate at WrestleMania 18, introducing the bigger bad that is the NWO, all while hopefully not losing much main event momentum between Mania X7 and SummerSlam while The Rock's away becoming the Pince of Prince or whatever the f Austin can turn heel that are enough just about main event talent to feud with. There's an actual reason for it happening and it builds into something that desperately needed fixing. So that is how I would book Steve Austin's 2001 heel turn. I still think it shouldn't have happened. Just ride with Austin as your top face. People like him, they buy his merch. They're happy to see him. What, why fix what isn't broken? But here is my fix of them breaking what wasn't broken. Did you like it? Let me know what else you'd like me to book. Make sure you're subscribed to Parts of Unknown. And if you enjoyed this video, why not tell people about it on the internet? Hey, look, watch this video, etc. Uh, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next month. And never forget to jam that jam.